Thank you, Sherry. Hey, to do good day is a brilliant idea. I think it is so attractive that maybe we have to think to make every day a good, a good do day <laughs> all our life. Really, it's a wonderful occasion, and I want to compliment you on the idea and the fact you have mobilized so many volunteers to do so. My office today was totally at your disposal, painting different things in Jerusalem. I hope they did good. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a new world, new age, and we, the Jewish people, too, have to adopt ourselves to the new age. We cannot live on the past. Most people prefer to remember rather than to think. But memories are not really something too serious. Because what we remember is the nice part of our life. We forget all the troubles. So we have a wrong idea about the past. When you have to think, you can see all the novelties, all the new efforts you have to introduce. And you're a little bit worried to depart from the home you know and enter a structure which you don't have the slightest idea about it. So we live in a world that has advanced with our brains and memories, which are a little bit late in the day. And we have to fix, in my judgment, an agenda, a new agenda for Jewish life. I shall be very brief on it. I think the Jewish agenda today should be based on three principles. One, to keep the priority of the moral code in everything we do. If something characterized the Jewish history, if something can characterize the Jewish mission in the future, is not to go after power or beauty or love. It's important, but always to prefer the moral judgment. The moral judgment is what you had said, to consider the other person, the other man, as you consider yourself. We have a, a prepared document for it. That's the Ten Commandments. All told, it's 172 words. That's it. It's 3,500 years old. And as Churchill remarked once, he says, since then, there were many laws and suggestions and books and ideas. None of them had made it necessary to change one word in the 172 words of the Ten Commandments. It's a guidance. It started in Hebrew, but became actually the base of the entire civilization all over the world. The second point, the second principle, is to love knowledge, to keep our curiosity, to try, to try and think every day anew, to see the changes in our life. And if you'll ask me, what is the greatest contribution of the Jewish people to the rest of the world, I would say dissatisfaction. A good Jew cannot be satisfied, really. The minute he begins to be satisfied, I doubt, I doubt his Jewishness. <laughs> Jews are never satisfied with any situation, with any occasion, neither with themselves nor with the others. The French uh, encyclopedia described the Jewish people as the people that didn't let the world, the world fall asleep. We don't let others fall asleep. We cannot fall asleep. They're all the time active, trying to question. You know, Jews don't look for the right answers. They look for the right questions. Because if you don't have the right question, you won't have the right answer. So generation after generation, you'll find the Jewish people in the forefront, forefront of changes, of thinking, of uh, revolutions. And it so happened that uh, it's recognized by the rest of the world. I mean, 25% uh, of the Nobel Prize laureates are Jewish. Because why? We don't sleep. We are not satisfied. <laughs> we are always in search, always for looking for something new, something different, what you call and we call Tikkun Olam. We want to produce a better man and a better world. And the third point of the Jewish agenda today is to seek peace. 
the world is peaceless. We saw what happened just now with the four kids in France. It's a terrible crime when you think about it. It's no longer the traditional way of confrontations between armies or among armies. It's more terror. It's vicious people. They can be a minority. They can be a small group. The damage they can cause is unbelievable. Look what a small group did to the United States of America in 9-11. 3,000 innocent people lost their lives. But since then, the United States has spent over a trillion dollars in home security, fighting in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and it's not the end. And we have to fight this evil situation. A small vicious group of people can endanger the life of our children, of our elders, of innocent people. These are, in my judgment, the three points of the Jewish agenda, which is more important than all the other organizations and streams. This answers the new world. And what is the new world? The new world made all of the known institutions in a questionable, questionable situation. Governments became weak and they will become weaker and weaker. You don't have any strong government anymore. Leaders are becoming weak if they exist, and the existence of leaders will go down more and more. Because they don't have a real role. We were, the governance in the world was based on nations and on hierarchies and on leadership. No more. Because the economy is no longer national. The economy is global. There is no country which is not affected by globality, and there is no country that can affect globality. It's a huge ship. It's not, not without a captain, without a flag. Tremendous power, unpredictable. And uh, we see solid countries like Italy or Spain all of a sudden fall down. We don't know how did it happen. Where were the governments? And uh, before I shall go further, I think the globality has some positive achievements, which we don't notice enough. I think globality put an end to racism. You cannot have a global company and be a racist. You want to have all clients, black and white and yellow, no matter their color. And if you begin with racism, you'll go bankrupt. And it's not only that you have a good product to sell, you have to have goodwill. You sell goodwill, not only good products. And if you will not represent the multitude, the differences of our life, you won't be accepted globally. I have been just in the States and I visited California after a long while. And uh, it's so far away from what used to be the WASP America. And, uh, laboratories in the headquarters of the business. You have really representatives from all over the globe, Indians and Chinese and Africans and from all over the world. And they live together and act together. It's a great achievement because racism is one of the greatest mistakes that characterize the history of humankind. The other thing is openness. With all this new communication, you can no longer blind people. It's very difficult. Look at the Middle East. It was a place where dictators had a good time. No more. It's so difficult to be a dictator in the Middle East. <laughs> Why? Because people are not, don't agree to be blind. My God, what can they do? So part of them went all to the other world. The others are in difficulties. But dictatorship doesn't have a future. Actually, people say, why do you want to rule us? What for? And when a leader appears on television and says, I'm strong, I'm wise, I'm great, people look at him and say, we are not sure about it. We know people, they are not so great as you claim, and we are not so small as you may think. So we don't want you to rule, and we don't want us to be ruled by you. And that's the reason why it's so difficult to be a leader, unless the leader will understand that leadership in our time is not to be on the top, 
but to be ahead, to move ahead, but not to rule the other people. If you want to be a leader, you must create the confidence among the people that you came to serve them, not to rule them. Because if you cannot rule the economy, it's global, so you cannot rule also the security, which is global in a different way, disorganized all over the world. And as I've said, a small group of people can change the life of so many. And if they have nuclear power, even more so. If you put a single stone in a basket full of eggs, doesn't matter that the eggs are the majority. The stone may define, decide their future. You know what? I visited uh, with uh, Zuckerberg at uh, the Facebook. I looked at this young man, 27 years old, and I thought, look, maybe he created a greater revolution than Lenin. Lenin, the Soviet revolution, cost 30 million lives. Dictatorship, corruption, lack of freedom. And finally, it went bankrupt. Look at the history of the communist revolution, which lasted for 60 or 70 years. Look at this young man. He didn't have an army. He didn't have an organization. He didn't have a fortune. He even didn't know what will happen with his idea. And a single idea changed the entire world overnight. And it's still not the end of it. So it's a different world. Who can run it? and who can predict it. That's the reason why economy, at least theoretically, is bankrupt. Economy could have been predict predicted when you have something which is measurable or tangible, like land. And for that reason, people went to fight for land, defend land, extend land. They created, in order to fight, armies. Armies created disciplines and hierarchies it's no longer relevant to our life. Can you conquer wisdom by armies? Can you become wise by wars? Can you be strong by rules? You know, I was 60 years in the administration in different uh, jobs. And I asked myself, on what did I spend most of my time? You know, on what? On frictions. Frictions among people, among institutions, frictions with other companies. All the time I was engaged. I was the most controversial gentleman in this country. Now they fired me. I became a president. So I don't have administration. So I don't have friction. <laughs> and I'm free to do. And you know what? I feel today I'm in a better position than ever. When I was, say, prime minister, I could give an order. People didn't like the orders, you know. Now when I'm president, I don't order. I ask. And if you ask the same person who refuses to a bite to your order, we'll gladly volunteer to whatever you want. It's a government of goodwill. And goodwill is more meaningful, finally, than orders and armies and wars and so on. So, unintentionally, the world, and you know what, now I'm the most uh, popular man in Israel, so the polls are saying, I don't know when I was happier, by the way. I think when I was controversial, I thought I'm fighting for something. Now I'm asking myself, what did you do wrong that you're so popular? Apparently, you don't <laughs> fight enough. But anyway, instead of fighting, you can invite, you can call together, you can introduce a hope. Israel was lucky enough to be a country without anything. I remember the first days of Israel. At best, it was a doubt, not a hope. You know, we had a small piece of land, all told Israel is what? One per mil of the Arab space. They are just one thousandth of the size of the Arab space. That's it. The land wasn't friendly. Swamps in the north, deserts in the south, Without water, we have a great river by the name, the Jordan River. 
that is richer in history than in water. It's not a river for irrigation. It's a river for praying, if you want. We have two lakes, one dead, the other is dying. <laughs> we don't have any natural resource, neither gold or silver or gas or oil. In a hostile surrounding, at the time we were 650,000 people, 650, Jewish people against 40 million. And really, what could we do? Outgunned, outmanned, outproportioned. You know what? That was our great luck. The minute we discovered that we have nothing, we discovered that we have something which is greater than any nothingness, and that is the human being. Israel is a story of people that have enriched the land more than the land has enriched the people. Without having water, without having land, we created one of the best agricultures on earth. Unbelievable. It's an agriculture without land and water. It's an agriculture based on high tech. Our yields per dunam are 10 times higher than in any other country. The use of water is just a third what other countries are using. And I'm looking at Russia. Russia is 1,000 times the size of Israel. Russia has 1,000 sweet water lakes. And we export to whom? Israel to Russia. Carrots, I remember when the communist Russia created uh, the official relations with Israel, the first thing they bought from us was cows. Why cows? It came out that the Israeli cow produces four times more milk than a communist cow. <laughs> the same cow with the same horns, the same people. And to this very day, we send car carrots to Russia and avocado to Paris and flowers to London. And by the way, the farmers in Israel are having a good time. Each of them is almost a scientist, every kibbutznik and every moshavnik. And every kibbutz and every moshav and every piece of land became really a laboratory. Every time I see a new tomato, small and red and yellow, my God, they're driving us crazy. Nobody rests on what we have, the same story. So we have the, an example of what human can do. I'm saying it because the Middle East today, the real problem in the Middle East today, in my judgment, is poverty, not politics. There is no water, no air, no energy, no food. And Israel has shown that even when you are poor materially, you can introduce science and technology and become a different country. And what we are doing, everybody can do. And many countries are really trying to learn from the Israeli experience, including China, including India. I wish the Arabs would do it too. We are the same land, the same region, the same climate. We started at the same point, and that is the future. So we hang more and more on goodwill. And may I say about you, heads of companies and organizations, it's not the old barons that used to be. You didn't make your strengths by exploiting other people, by using force, by cheating, by fighting. Most of the leaders I know, the industrial and the scientific leaders, are educated people. And they know that without goodwill, they cannot make the companies. Many of them are voluntarily giving back money to their communities, are trying to improve any, at any place they work, and they have to. They wouldn't like any of them. The day of their children will be considered as profiteers from the poor people. They want the poor people have the same hope and the same occasion, maybe, as the rich one. And uh, that's a world awakening and coming together again. What I want to say also is that the coming decade, in my judgment, will be the most dramatic decade in human annals. What we shall see in 10 years' time is unbelievable. 
unrecognized, unpredicted by most of us. Because the shortage of material make us look for alternatives. And the obvious alternative we have is on our shoulders, our brain. It's unbelievable. The brain is the most illustrious instrument on Earth. Unbelievable. The brain enabled us to create artificial brains, artificial intelligence, but didn't enable us to understand our own brain. So on our shoulders, we have a wonderful machine that guides us, that makes us happy or unhappy, extreme or moderate, and we don't know how it functions. But what we know, that there are wonders in the brain. Just to give you one example, you know, the IBM, I just visited them, wanted to create an artificial brain. They started with a worm. A worm is a brainless almost creature. It has only 600 neurons. It's very simple to understand how the brain functions, so it's not a brain. It's a symbol of a brain. And then they wanted to go further, and the next was to create an artificial brain the size of a mouse. A mouse, if the worm has 600 neurons, the mouse has 20 millions. The human brain has 10 billions. It's 5,000 stronger, wiser than the brain of a mouse. So to create an artificial brain equal to the brain of the mouse, you need 3,000 watts of electricity. You cannot go further because then the computer will be bound down. So they have computers with 3,000 watts. The human brain, which is 5,000 times stronger than that, needs 20 watts only. One breakfast is enough to supply the energy you need. What does it mean? It means that how to use energy is more important than how to discover sources of energy. And uh, all the time, we are miniaturing. If you compare the first computer 25 years ago, you could hardly put it in that room. So you have a smartphone in your pocket, and everything what you used to have in the great computer, you have today in your pocket. It reduced the cost and the effectiveness of it by a million times in 25 years. And if it's small, you don't need more material, much material. You don't need much energy. It's a revolution. And everybody today has a computer in his pocket. You know, when Kennedy announced that his vision is to send a person to the moon, all the electronics that were needed to elevate a man to the moon is today concentrated in your smartphone. Unbelievable. But that's not the end. The smartphone is not yet the smallest instrument. It will become smaller and smaller, which means less material, less energy, less uh, work, more opportunities. And I think that uh, I gave one example I can give many. Uh, several years ago, I thought that the, in the center of our uh, research should be the nanotechnology. Today, I think it's the brain. We made uh, research on that subject. There are five different domains in the brain. Israel is too small to handle all the five. Israel can select one or two. And we did select, according to the advice we got, where Israel is almost the leading country in the world. These two domains are the interface between the computer and the brain. And you have already evidence. You can put an electrode in your head, and you are free from uh, Parkinson's time. Already 1,000 uh, operations took place in Jerusalem. You can smell, smell today a malady. We have a nanonose that can smell cancer, so you don't have to penetrate the body. And you can discover it at an early stage. It's fantastic. And we are not alone, the whole world, and now the community of scientists will be millions and millions of people. This will be the greatest sensation 
to discover new materials, new engagements, new connections, new opportunities, new packages. And uh, I think the greatest industry probably will be in 10 years, the production of human spare parts, which will be possible, it's already possible today. And the greatest branch of the economy, the greatest employer, will be education. The more we shall know, the less we shall work. The more the people will be engaged in learning and researching and researching, the less people will engage in work. So unemployment will be changed. People will be employed in different branches of the economy. We have to adopt ourselves to this age. And you know, if economy became global, science remains individual. With Zuckerberg, Sergei, Irene Israel, look how many talents you have, unbelievable. Israel lives on exits of our discoveries for a simple reason. We are too small to become a market and too small to become an industry. So what we can be is a pro producer of discoveries. We produce and sell. Uh, Cisco just now bought an Ameri a Israeli company by five billion dollars. And it's not bad, you know, as an income. And uh, the Israeli high tech is basically a contribution of individual people. Entrepreneurs, scientists, people with imagination. Basically, I believe we have to educate our children how to dream not how to remember, how to envision, and not how to pack your head with stories which are irrelevant today anymore. What is it important to know every battle that Napoleon fought? You know, he fought many, he killed enough people, so we shall remember him for a long time. If you want the tail, press on your computer, you'll get everything. Why should you carry your in head in your head? But your head is better than a computer. Your head can imagine. The computer cannot. So the interface between the two is the greatest promise. And since, as I have said, we have to keep our moral priorities, namely to care about people, other people, and to be engaged in knowledge, thriving for curiosity and novelty to improve the world, and by doing so, making war most irrelevant and bringing peace. This will keep our Jewish identity for the future. Now, what I would like, since I understand your people are ready to contribute, what I would recommend very much, that invest in the research and already in the industries of the brain in the future. There are already many companies, some of them are brilliant, unbelievable achievements. It will take me a long time to describe what already exists. And as with the nanotechnology, which made today Israel one of the leading countries in the world by doing the same thing, by your people. Uh, I started to speak about it, but some of you opened their pockets and we collected $500 million to invest in nanotechnology giving to research institutes, universities. This is the future. And uh, another thing which is more symbolic, you know, the evidence that we are such a people is recognized in many ways. For example, in China, they think that the fathers of the Jewish people are three. Albert Einstein, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud. They don't know much about Abraham and Moses, but they say if the Jews have so, so great uh, parents, probably they are wise people. There is no sense to try and argue about it. By the way, I was recently in Vietnam and I felt really promoted because the Vietnamese told me that Karl Marx, Sigmund Freund, and Albert Einstein are Israelis. <laughs> Not bad. I didn't deny it either. <laughs> but uh, it so happened that by a world poll, 
it came out that Einstein is considered the greatest brain in the last thousand years by contribution. And it so happened that Albert Einstein was really Jewish. He was a Zionist. And he sold out all his belongings, all his papers, to the Hebrew University. You know, there are the protocol of the elders of Zion. I think we have to write the protocols of the wise men of science. Our elders didn't do any harm to anybody. Our elders contributed to so many people and otherwise. And I think Albert Einstein symbolizes it. So I think now, if you're ready to contribute to it, I should be delighted. We want to build a museum in Jerusalem where all the belongings of Einstein, he left 90,000 letters and documents handwritten, including by the, by the way, love letters. It was published to, the, to him and by him. And I think we want to make the museum look like the head of Einstein. I think it will be a unique museum. And then there, really to locate the collective wisdom of the Jewish people, the Google company agreed to send it over electronically to every home. I think it will also give Jerusalem something that belonged to her and is missing from her, a symbol of Jewish knowledge and wisdom. And by the way, on, in, in addition to that, I'm negotiating with the Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> the United Nations holding one of the most beautiful places in Jerusalem the palace of the British High Commissioner. It was a beautiful building, a beautiful location. Today it houses uh, ex-officers from the United Nations Forces. It's ex-territorial. I told the Secretary General of the United Nations, let's make out of this palace, out of this building, which is now deteriorating, a world center for brain research. Everybody can come there without a visa because the land is, uh, doesn't belong to any nation. And I think if you shall have these two buildings in Jerusalem, it will give the right meaning to Jerusalem itself. And uh, then we discovered oil and gas. Frankly, it worries me very much. I think, look what we did without oil and gas. Nobody was lazy. Nobody was pampered. Nobody was looking for luck because oil you don't produce. Oil you discover, it's a lottery. It's not a result of a human investment, a human effort. And I'm so much afraid it will make us lazy and uh, happy and unduly. I think all the Egon from gas and oil in order to make from it the right use should go for research and education. You know, we know that if a baby doesn't get the right food at the early age from one to three, he will not develop the body that carry that can carry his future. No reason why every baby in Israel will not have the right food, whether it comes from a poor or rich family, or the kindergartens for all of them, or to make all the schools in Israel modern, digital, as they should. And by the way, Arabs and Jews, we are now also trying, you know, the Arabs in Israel are not discriminated by law, but they are discriminated in fact because they live on the land where we live on science. And if they want to have high tech, they will not reach the same level that the Jewish people have. So we have to enable them to get high education, to create a center of high tech. There is no peace without equality, real equality, and real peace. So if we shall use it properly, and we shall not stop using our brains, our character, our tradition, our vision, it won't do a service to us. 
But if you can match our experience of the capability, to do with the capabilities of every single person with a gift founded by accident and invested correctly to make Israel a land of science. Milk and money and electronics to add to it. We cannot live on the land, we don't have enough land, but we can live on the brains. This is our only option. And this country is full of talent, unbelievable. You know, I go every day through in every domain. I didn't imagine, for example, that Israel will be strong in movies. All of a sudden, I see we are about trying to get every Oscar prize available. And again, there are talents. Wherever you move, you see people talented. And these talents should be used, not for self-profits, but really to create a better society, a better man, a better world. So this is my suggestion, how to do the day a good day and the life a good life. To have better people, a better world, and enabling our people to be a contributing people to the rest of the world. Thank you very much.